Hello everybody, welcome to the third episode of Mondays with Mate and today we are going to talk about the specific challenges when creating an electric hypercar. Once you start designing the car, the first thing you do is the so-called package, meaning you distribute the main components of the car in the positions. You have the wheelbase of the car, uh, the width, the height, the position of the person, the age point of the person, um, and then you start designing the components. One decision we made early on is not to have the battery all the way in the floor, uh, like most electric cars have today, so we decided to do it differently. So we wanted to obviously design a hypercar, so we couldn't have the batteries all the way in the floor because then uh, the seat goes up, uh, and if the seat goes up, the age point goes up, if the age point goes up, the roof goes up, and it's not a hypercar shape anymore. So we have a car out of the battery pack in the seat area, so the seat could go very low. We have part of the battery pack in the uh, foot area, so there is some battery modules under the foot because we wanted to have more weight in the front, so when the car accelerates and the weight gets uh, transferred to the rear, that we have grip for the front powertrain to have the maximum acceleration. We have a battery pack in the tunnel area of the car and behind the seats, but still very low. So the center of gravity of the car is actually somewhere around the wheel axle. So it's extremely low center of gravity and uh, all the main components are inside the monocoque. Uh, then we wanted it to be very easy to get in and out. Here you can see the doors are really huge, very large doors. And with the door together, part of the roof also gets out of the way when you open it. And if you look at the monocoque, you can see how the monocoque goes inwards compared to the wheel of the car. And why we did that? It's because uh, we wanted to make it easy to put your foot down while you sit in the car. We are doing the global crash test, which means there's lots of energy going through the structure um, to absorb the impact. So there's lots and lots of engineering to make this work, for example. Then another uh, challenge is range. We wanted to have 550, 600 kilometers of range according to the WLTP cycle. And in order to achieve that, you have to have a good drag coefficient uh, of the aerodynamics, but also a relatively low rolling resistance. So if you want to have good grip on the track, you have to have downforce, which means you are creating drag, but also you have to have a very good tire that has good grip. Good grip usually means bad rolling resistance. So a lot of things have to be done, like for example, active aerodynamics that are uh, trimmed to downforce and fast driving when you need to, but when you just go on a highway or cruise, that the rolling resistance or the air resistance is low, so you can have a higher range. There's not really much we can compare the seat to width as an electric hypercar, but we can compare it against the combustion engine hypercar. So it's very, very powerful, 1,900 horsepower. So the closest which would come to it is a Bugatti Chiron, and the Chiron is pretty much two tons. And here we have a car that has this huge battery pack. You can see the shape a little bit here. So it's like an H shape. So this is the part below the feet, the tunnel, and then the rear part. And this battery pack has to deliver uh, 1.4 megawatts of power and at the same time have enough energy for 600-ish kilometers of range. And this battery pack is over 600 kilograms. And then you have to achieve the weight of a comparable combustion engine hypercar with this additional weight. And then you have four electric motors, four inverters and four gearboxes. One limiting factor there is the tire. Because the tire has a load index limit uh, which means uh, how much force can you apply to the tire at different speeds. When the car is standing still we are fine, but as we move up uh, with speed, the load index starts to drop, so the weight of the car is actually combined with the uh, tire load index, is limiting how much downforce we can apply to the car, because there is too much force on the tire. And that's why the active aerodynamics at some point during high speed have to reduce actually the downforce so that we don't overload the tires at high speed. One of the main aspects that people don't really understand yet because electric cars are relatively new is torque. So people think electric cars don't need gearboxes, 
and the electric motors have so much torque that you have incredible acceleration. That's only partially true. So if you again make a comparison with a combustion engine car, the C2 has 2,300 newton meters torque on the shafts of all four motors. The Bugatti Chiron has 1,600 newton meters on the uh, shaft of the engine. But that's not the whole truth. The thing that actually accelerates you is the force on the tires. A combustion engine car has many gears to multiply the torque from the engine until the wheels. With an electric car, it can be different. It can be a single speed gearbox or a multiple speed gearbox like with this prototype. So let's take, for example, the combustion engine hypercar, the Bugatti Chiron. So it has in first gear a 3.15 ratio plus the final drive ratio of 3.6, which makes for a total ratio of 11 something, uh, which results in 18,000 newton meters at the wheels in the first gear. In second gear, the ratio is lower, so it drops from 18,000 to 13,000. In third gear, it drops already to 8,000 and so on. If you have a single speed gearbox, like most electric cars, it's basically like driving in your last gear in a combustion engine car. And now we managed to improve the performance of the motors and increase the RPM of the motors so that we can achieve the acceleration and the top speed with single speed gearboxes all around, in the front and in the rear. So with a single speed gearbox now for the production car, we are achieving 13,500 Newton meters on the wheels uh, with a single speed which is less than the combustion engine hypercar uh, in first gear, but much more than the combustion engine hypercar in all of the other gears. Maybe another interesting thing is that we don't have a differential, neither front, near in the rear or in the middle. There is, it's just software based, it's software differentials if you want. So based on the steering angle, based on throttle position, um, yaw rate sensor um, and the mathematical model of the vehicle, of the suspension, of the tires. So the algorithm is taking all of that into account. So the mathematical model even of the aerodynamics of the car, of uh, the behavior of the tire and so on. Um, so it's quite difficult to actually make the car drift and make it feel natural. So that's a big area that you are working on. And if you think about it, basically, since you are always in a single gear, uh, it's like being in seventh gear with your combustion engine hypercar. It means that one motor, because it's completely independent, uh, one wheel uh, from the others, it could happen that you drive like 20 kilometers per hour, but your wheel spins at 400 because you have slip. So to control all of this and to make it feel natural that the driver is still in control and enhance the driving experience and not take it away from the driver, that's a big topic and it's quite difficult to achieve and that's something that we are working on a lot. So to have this ability is really nice to play with these things, but we don't want to make it feel unnatural and artificial to the driver. So that's an important part of, of our work, but at the same time gives incredible freedom that we can do a lot of stuff. Some hypercars have really high maintenance costs. With like the hypercar, it's quite different. So first of all, the car is always connected to the internet. So here in headquarters, we know what's going on with the car and we can see if maybe there is something about to go wrong. Maybe we could see it before the actual customer sees it. For example, if one battery cell is performing less than the others, we could maybe notice it before the driver notices it. But in terms of regular maintenance, there is not much required for this car. So for example, the brakes are wearing out less because most of the time in normal road use, you would brake much more with the powertrain than with the actual brakes. Um, and there is no oil changes or stuff like that. There is some regular maintenance, like every couple of years, the car should come in to check the tires, to check just the fluids of the cooling system and so on. So the cost compared to other hypercars should be really uh, negligible. I was always scared that much bigger companies with much deeper pockets will come to this space and be much faster than us, especially when we were doing the concept one. I was always thinking, oh, like, I'm sure in six months there will be like 500 like you hypercars. But we showed the concept one in 2011 and basically there wasn't much going on. And now finally they started to pick up. We are helping a lot of other companies make both hybrid and electric hypercars. So a lot of the stuff that you see in the C2 is also in the Pinifarina Batista. We are also uh, having part in some other uh, hypercar projects. There are also some others that we don't have anything to do with. So it started to pick up and we will see some really interesting cars, I think, coming soon. And I kind of hope that what happened with the last generation of hypercars, the holy trinity of the 918 P1 and LaFerrari, that there will be 
a holy trinity maybe of the electric hypercars, so that would be interesting to see. That was it for today. Thank you very much for watching. I hope I didn't nerd you out too much with the technical stuff, uh, but let me know what you would like to know more about uh, from us, on which areas to focus more in these videos, and maybe let us know what you think an electric hypercar should look like in the future.